I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, just um, for some uh, points, uh, just regarding the session, just some administrative points. Uh, we always ask everyone, obviously, to silence cell phones and mobile devices. Um, uh, we're, this, uh, we're already near capacity just at the start, so if people can, to the extent possible, sort of scooch into the center to make sure that we have space for everyone, that would be um, great. Um, also want to remind people that photographs and filming are prohibited. Um, uh, and uh, for other faculty who will be uh, attending future lectures, um, please check in at the speaker ready desk uh, four hours in, in advance of your session. Uh, final uh, point is for evaluations. We no longer have uh, paper evaluations. Most people will probably have noticed that. Um, the expectation is that you guys will use the app for that now so that we can collect that information uh, electronically, which is both more efficient and, and obviously environmentally friendly. Um, so otherwise, I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, understanding uh, immune uh, obstacles to cell and gene therapies. Um, this was a, is a new topic in the education session uh, this year. Uh, was chosen because I think of the increasing uh, understanding that as our vector systems have gotten better and better, um, for the most part, the challenges that we're facing are very often immunologic ones. We're able to deliver a gene effectively, we're able to see expression in, in some cases, and then immune responses against vector components uh, or the transgene can often limit the potency of, uh, of, our, of our therapies. And uh, we wanted to try to get perspectives from some of the experts in the field um, covering different types of cell and gene therapies. So, um, we have one speaker that's going to cover some of the immune responses that we can see to autologous uh, therapies. An another one of our speakers will cover um, uh, responses against uh, AAV vector systems. And our final um, uh, speaker is going to cover some of the challenges uh, that are involved in trying to think about engrafting uh, allogeneic cells across uh, uh, MHC barriers. Um, so with that, I'd like to get things started. Our, our first speaker is uh, Cor Lammers. Uh, he is a um, member of the Laboratory of Tumor Immunology in the Department of Medical Oncology at Erasmus University uh, Medical Center in Rotterdam, and he's going to talk to us about uh, preventing and coping with immune responses against CAR T cells. Cor? In, in this um, education, uh, education session this afternoon, I want to talk to you about the immune responses that can be uh, raised against CAR T cells um, and uh, how we should, uh, yeah, how we can prevent and cope with them. Um, Okay. Um, in, in this presentation, I, I want to take you along uh, some uh, basic immunologi immunological principles, as uh, this educational part, uh, going from that uh, to uh, CAR T cell treatment and the immunogenicity of uh, the gene modified T cells. Uh, next, uh, uh, subsequently, I will uh, show you several examples of uh, uh, CAR T cell clinical cell studies in solid tumors and the immunogenicity that has been seen in that uh, type of uh, studies. Uh, apart from that, we have, uh, there's a lot of intention uh, for the, the B cell malignancies, especially with the CD19 CAR T cells, but also these T cells in, in some of these studies, we have recorded uh, uh, immunological uh, uh, effects, uh, of, uh, effects on the immune system. Um, finally, I will go into uh, how to prevent these anti-CAR T uh, anti immune responses and uh, have here some uh, take home messages. Uh, the immunological princip uh, principles are yeah, restricted to the fact that uh, membrane-bound uh, antigens can be recognized by, by uh, antibodies, while uh, the uh, uh, epitopes from these membrane-bound antibodies are processed in, in the cell and expressed in major, uh, MHC molecules to pr present a peptide that's recognized by a T-cell receptor. And uh, 
all antigens that are cytosolic in a cell, either self or also foreign antigens that are introduced by viruses, are processed in the cytosol and epitopes are released in the uh, in, 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 in plasmatic reticulum to, to be loaded into MHC molecules and presented at the uh, surface of the, uh, of, the, of the cell. CAR T cell uh, therapy you will be uh, acquainted with, with uh, cells are taken uh, out of the body and uh, retrovirally or lentivirally transduced to, uh, to introduce the, the, the transgene that is subsequently expressed on uh, most of the cells that are subsequently uh, reintroduced in, into the patient. And uh, lots of these patients receive prior to this infusion a uh, cytoreductive therapy by means of uh, uh, cyclophosphamide or flu flu fludarabine. The, uh, uh, the, the, the cars nowadays have, uh, have, uh, have uh, evolved in, into the third generation already, but all these uh, cars, uh, yeah, molecules have uh, yeah, they, these are made of these are synthetic anti, uh, uh, molecules that are composed of uh, a an, an single uh, chain varial parts of the heavy and the light chain of an, of an antibody. Most of the time, they are not human. They are uh, usually, usually mouse derived. Uh, there is a hinge part. There is also intercellular membrane part, and there is an intercellular part, which the, uh, with uh, all kinds of stimulatory domains can be included in that. In the first uh, uh, generation, uh, only CD3 zeta ex uh, extended with uh, uh, other co-stimulatory signals uh, up to three uh, in, in some of these patients now. These uh, molecules uh, bear unique epitopes, uh, especially as they, they are um, made of, most of them are made of uh, mouse uh, single chain uh, variable uh, for bind binding parts. Uh, these are expressed on the membrane, so they could be recognized by antibodies, but also the unique uh, peptide sequences that can that are presented in the MHC complex can be uh, recognized by, uh, by T cells, so are also immunogenic. And uh, potentially immunogenic uh, sequences are the, uh, the non-human um, elements of the binding part, but also the fusion part of the different kind of components. And uh, in several uh, studies also, uh, additional uh, amino acid uh, modifications have been introduced. That means that uh, when you're looking at uh, immune responses against uh, human responses, that might be uh, might be antibodies, antibodies that recognize the binding part of this antibody, so-called uh, anti-idiotypic uh, uh, antibodies, um, but also anti-idiotypic anti antibodies can also be uh, to the non uh, non-blocking part, but and also uh, antibodies uh, that are directed against the murine framework uh, uh, epitopes. This, uh, this leads to uh, blocking of the CAR receptor and also uh, to opsonizing these CAR T cells so that they can be easily uh, eliminated by the immune system. Uh, the uh, peptides that are expressed in the MHC complex will be recognized by, CAR, by the by the CD8 T cells, and uh, these CD8 T cells, they can kill the cell that is expressing this uh, epitope. Um, it has been recognized already uh, about 20 years ago that uh, gene-modified T cells can be uh, uh, recognized by the immune system, by the uh, group of Stanley Wardell, and uh, they showed uh, that uh, T cells that were uh, uh, provided with an HVTK uh, antigen just for, for uh, eliminating them after uh, the don uh, DLIs, uh, donor lymphocyte infusions, that this, uh, these cells were uh, visible after a sing for the first infusion, but not for too long time of period. And after the second infusion, the, the cells uh, most of the time had very low numbers after that. In uh, investigating the, the PBMC of these patients, they were able to, to, uh, to show that the PBMC harbored anti-HVTK uh, 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 
positive T cell of a positive cell uh, reactivities. They, they could kill them. And they were able to, to show by, uh, in the, by, peptide, by protein, spe protein spinning peptide testing that these cells could be recognized uh, through uh, the uh, different epitopes, and there were multiple epitopes that were, uh, were uh, seen by these positive T's by the immune system of these patients. So that, uh, that means that lots of, that even a single administration of these uh, uh, gene-modified T cells uh, was sufficient to raise an immune response against these T cells. Um, another um, study I want to show you is the one that made use of that observation that when you uh, 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 put transgenes in a T cells, that uh, epitopes of that transgene are expressed on these T cells and can elicit immune responses. That was done by the group of Russo. Uh, they uh, introduced Mage A3 antigen in the T cells and uh, then uh, uh, vaccinated patients with the uh, melanoma patients with Mage A3 uh, alone or in combination with the HVTK and then uh, looked for the frequency of, of uh, uh, responder cells of uh, yeah, uh, uh, cells. Uh, that recognized this mage is 3 and then you s they saw uh, that the frequency of these cells really raised after several vaccinations. And uh, they, the, the, the patients that really showed an uh, increase in the frequency of these cells appeared to be the cells that uh, the patient that also responded to the therapy. Uh, whereas the patients that uh, uh, showed resp yeah, the, the, patient, the reactivity against the uh, uh, take TK, uh, part uh, could not discriminate between patients that were responding or not. Here you see the, 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 the survival curves of uh, uh, probability of the patients that reacted against uh, this uh, mage A3 that had a positive mage A3 response versus no positive re uh, response, whereas there was no discrimination with the TK. So that means that uh, uh, it shows that gene modified T cells are in fact uh, a very potent uh, mean to induce immune responses in, in patients. When we go to the CAR T cells, and, and I define it now in the solid tumors first, <coughs> then we see that there have been lots of uh, uh, antigens targeted. Uh, the antibodies that are used for that are mostly murine. There are two chimeric uh, ones, but most are murine. Most were so far from the first generation. And uh, there have been studies without lymphodepletion and studies with lymph lymphodepletion prior to uh, uh, in, uh, infusion these cells into the patients. Uh, the dose range is rather high. Uh, most of the studies use high levels of, of uh, T cells that are infused, and also multiple, in, uh, multiple infusions have, uh, have been given. And despite all these uh, efforts to get an, a very high level of T cells in the, in, in the blood of the patients, you see that the uh, persistence of these cells in the, in the blood of patients is relatively low. Um, going to the in, uh, uh, registered immune responses, then we see that, that there have been uh, humoral responses recorded in almost all uh, 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 studies that have uh, applied no uh, lymphodepletion, uh, whereas that's not the case for, for the studies that did uh, apply lymphodepletion. And uh, we saw, it have been documented, uh, in the, and that's my own study, uh, very uh, high levels of cellular immunity uh, uh, against the CAR T cells. Uh, I will come back to some of these studies in, in, in a minute. But also, uh, here we see one study uh, two, uh, with, uh, uh, in, in which after lymphodepletion, uh, even after lymphodepletion, there is an uh, immunity also on the, on the cellular immune level available. So um, when you look at the table, we can say we have a very limited T CAR T cell expression of a persistence in, in, in the solid tumors and uh, the documented immune responses in most of them. 
uh, features um, that are probably involved in, in this uh, observation is the, the mouse uh, uh, nature of the single chain uh, uh, antibody used for the, for the car, the, uh, whether or not you use lymph depletion and also <coughs> the car cell dose and frequency. The first example uh, I will show was the study of, of Jensen that, that did uh, uh, use uh, uh, lymph depletion but they used a, a single chain against the CD20 and the, 20 and the CD, uh, C, uh, CD19, whether or not in combination with marker genes like uh, neo-resistant gene and the uh, IYTK. Uh, um, here they, they, show, they showed reported four patients in, in which the, the, these patients got multiple injections of cells. In three of these patients, the, after the first or second injection, the third or subsequent uh, injections did not show any persistence of cells in, in the blood anymore. Um, they looked in these patients uh, for antibody responses. They could not find them. And when, we, when they looked in, in these patients for anti-CAR T-cell T -cell responses, there were in three or four of these patients anti-CAR T-cell uh, responses were seen, but these specificities were all directed against the marker genes. And another study is uh, 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 an anti uh, study re recently published on, 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 the, on the clinical study that was uh, performed in the, in the late 90s, uh, t uh, targeting TAG-72 uh, um, in, in colon, colon cancer. And uh, in this study, they showed that uh, multiple injections of, of uh, cells uh, did not give you very high levels of, 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 uh, persisting, anti, of uh, persisting CAR T cells in, in, in the periphery. Looking in these patients, they all showed, all, uh, all but one, that there were uh, antibodies, uh, anti idiotypic antibodies uh, present in these patients after a single or a second uh, uh, infusion of the cells. So low persistence uh, and uh, 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 documented immunogenicity in third, uh, 11 of 13 patients. Um, this is the mesotelin uh, study in which RNA uh, uh, car uh, was, uh, was uh, introduced in, in, in T cells. And here we see that here were different schedules were applied for uh, um, patient treatment. Uh, in uh, the three patients were reported, and here we see one patient that really showed no cells after uh, multiple injections of, of these T cells. And looking in, in, in these patients, they uh, saw, especially in the, this one, uh, a an, an high level of uh, antibodies reacting against the CAR T cells. And uh, this was a patient that has been reported to give an anaphylactic uh, uh, reaction uh, after one of the, the last uh, T-cell responses. Uh, my own work uh, 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 considers the treatment of uh, patients with met metastatic renal cell cancer with carboxyanhydrase 9 CAR T-cells. We applied uh, several uh, uh, treatment schemes uh, we encountered liver toxicities in, in these patients because of cross-reactivity of the carboxyanhydrase 9 CAR T cells with the, uh, the bile ducts. And we were able to prevent part of this reactivity by uh, giving a parenteral antibody sh uh, dose of uh, shot prior to uh, introducing this, uh, the, the, this, giving the cells to the patients. In this study, we also saw behind, uh, uh, an, an, uh, an remarkable. Uh, so so uh, we looked in at, at, at the per, per persistence, a period of persistence of these uh, cells, and we saw uh, some very uh, strange patterns. Here we see, for example, uh, this is the cells measured by flow cytometry versus the. the DNA copies in blood that we could not detect anymore the cells by flow cytometry by means of an anti idiotypic antibody, whereas the, uh, the copy numbers were still present uh, in the blood. Uh, that yeah, made us think there might be an, an, an blocking by anti idiotypic antibodies. This patient, we saw after the last infusion, two days after the last infusion, the cells were completely lost. Not only the, the cells in uh, 
measured by flow cytometry, but also the, the, the copy numbers were completely lost uh, after two days after the last T cell infusion. So we decided to go in, into the uh, analysis of, of, of this, this phenomena, and we uh, uh, assessed uh, anti-car uh, T cell immune of anti car T cell antibodies uh, by means of an ELISA to, and showed that there was an anti uh, idiotypic and uh, anti idiotypic antibodies but also anti mouse antibodies uh, uh, could be detected and that's, that these antibodies really fu uh, functionally inhibited the car T cell uh, uh, function. Um, we also assessed whether or not we had uh, uh, cellular immunity, and for that we uh, uh, set up uh, a system uh, in which autologous, uh, we call it an autologous uh, mixed lymphocyte culture, in which PBMC uh, from patients were uh, uh, co-cultured with gene modified T cells, and uh, we, uh, the readout was whether or not we could see uh, uh, activation of, of these PBMCs after these, uh, uh, these cultivations. In the first instance, we didn't see anything um, uh, in, in the blood of the patient that uh, it was taken prior to treatment or during and after treatment, but after several rounds of amplification uh, of these T PBMCs with the gene modified T cells, after three rounds of amplification, we, we started seeing reactivity, and uh, after five weeks, or five, five weeks, we saw uh, um, uh, even at day 36, that is two days after the last T-cell effusion, we saw uh, high levels of, of these uh, of a reactivity against the CAR T-cells. Uh, so that means that for this, this, this patient, we had really an, a huge uh, 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 antibody response, but also a uh, cellular immune response that came out, out a little bit later than where, uh, the time of infusion. Whereas in this patient, we had an, an, uh, even at, uh, at the end of the infusion day uh, of the second uh, uh, treatment cycle, we had already saw a very high level of, of uh, cellular immunity. Whereas, uh, surprisingly, in this patient, that was neg negative for the for antibodies. Um, next, we also uh, went into the epitope mapping, <coughs> also again uh, by these uh, protein-spanning peptide uh, pools, and we find out that uh, by, by by doing so, uh, by combining all uh, 84. Um, peptides, we did see a reactivity uh, similar to, or even better than to, when compared to autologous uh, CAR T cells, and by, uh, by doing matrix pools, we finally uh, find out that uh, uh, peptides 17 and 18 were the ones that should react, and here we see that when we uh, individually test these peptides, 16, 17, 18, 19, that 17 and 18 are the ones that uh, uh, are uh, recognized. Um, you, uh, here we see the uh, overall uh, reactivity of, 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 of the patients. Uh, all pa all, uh, nine of the ten patients uh, showed uh, reactivity against the CAR T cells, but also two of them showed reactivity against uh, CD24 transduced T cells. So that means it's an irrelevant T cell, uh, irrelevant transgene, but that we uh, concluded that from this uh, there might be an, uh, also an anti uh, retroviral component in these reactivities. Um, in all patients, or in six of uh, seven patients that tested, we could find epitopes uh, in, in the, for, for the, the CAR T cell. Only, uh, we saw only one epitope per patient, and these were all uh, uh, here, they were uh, listed, and also here in the scheme, they were uh, all directed, uh, three were directed against the CDR region and the others uh, uh, to the framework region of the, of the, uh, uh, the single chain. And uh, to our um, surprise, we did not see any uh, uh, epitopes of uh, reactivity against fusion epitopes. So the, this, this, these are the conclusions of, of our studies. I think uh, we have already uh, gone through that. When we, look, we are looking at the, the B cell uh, malignancies, uh, all with the antigen uh, targeted CD19, most of them have the uh, uh, FMC63 uh, uh, antibody, uh, second generation 
uh, cars, um, most of them are using lymphodepletion by cyclophosphamide or fludarabine. Uh, lower levels of, of cells are given. Most, most of you use only one infusion. And, uh, <coughs> and, when, and when we're looking at the, the immuno, uh, immune response here, uh, lots of, in lots of patients, no immune responses have been re recorded or uh, reported or uh, most, most studies do, do not mention it, so I suppose they have not looked for, for these uh, responses. In, um, in, in this study, they actually they were looked, they did, did not see any immune activity, uh, humoral immunity against the uh, CD19, but there was uh, uh, an indication for uh, uh, cellular immunity in, in these patients. In the last study of of, of turtle, they, uh, they looked uh, in, into uh, patients' groups, they compared also two treatment, uh, lymphodepleting treatment regimes, and especially in those patients, we, uh, they, they detected cellular immunity uh, against the uh, CAR, and again, uh, uh, probably has to, will have, have to do with the, the, the murine component of these uh, antibodies, whether or not lymph depletion, and maybe also the dose. When we look further into these CAR T cell uh, uh, studies for B cell malignancies, um, we see a rather variable persistence of these CD90 CAR T cells. And uh, most of the time, these uh, persistence is related to the uh, clinical uh, outcome. Uh, here we see an, a study of Cochrane uh, in uh, 2012, in which we have patients that do not respond, have a relatively show, uh, 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 short uh, uh, persistence of the, the, the CAR T cells in the blood, whereas the, pa the two patients that do respond have a really long persistence of the cells. Uh, another uh, study showing uh, persistence data, uh, combining that with clinical outcome, and you see that especially the, the complete re uh, responders in this study show uh, really long persistence uh, uh, to a year. Uh, the cell, uh, are, uh, cells can be detected in blood, whereas the partial remissions or especially the non-respondents really have no, uh, yeah, no or very short detection of the cells in the periphery. Most of the other, most of the studies uh, uh, have not considered anti-CAR, uh, CD19 CAR immune responses, despite the fact that uh, there are lots of differences between uh, the different studies and patients uh, regarding the T cell persistence. Um, here we see the, the, the turtle study in which um, uh, the car was a mouse CD19, uh, uh, the second generation. One cohort, they used cyclophosphamide, and the other cohort, cyclophosphamide and fludarabine to, to treat patients. And uh, here you see the pictures of the, 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 the persistence of cells in the, uh, in the patients that were treated with cyclophosphamide only. And in these patients, you see that, especially after the second uh, CAR infusion, no cells can be detected. So it is very uh, uh, suspect for immune re re reactivity that uh, eliminates the cells rather quickly. Uh, when you look at the, uh, uh, the, the CD4, uh, when you look at, at, at whether or not you have a f a fludarabine added to the, uh, to, to, uh, to the treatment or not, you see that you, uh, after adding the fludarabine, you really go up with the T cell numbers and then uh, that persists much longer, as shown in, in, the, in, the, in this graph. The patients that were treated, uh, several of them were evaluated for immune reactivity, especially uh, again with this, uh, with these peptide uh, mapping uh, uh, methods. And here we see again that uh, in, in the patients that receive uh, 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 lymphodepletion without the fludarabine, you have uh, at the end four of the five patients that uh, show immune reactivity, whereas there's only one in the group that uh, uh, received combined cyclophosphamide and fludarabine uh, uh, lymphodepletion. So that, uh, here we see that the anti-CD19 uh, uh, immune response um, 
that you see only after uh, uh, receiving a mild lymphodepletion. Um, so, the conclusions from the immunogenicity part is that the CAR T cells uh, are potentially strong immun immun immunogen because they have a membrane solid phase expression as a whole uh, uh, protein, but also as the peptide epitopes. And T cells also bear lots of co signaling molecules, so they are very able uh, to, to, to boost the immune system. Uh, the immunogenicity uh, depends on the nature of the, uh, uh, of the single chain, the level of immunocompetence, and uh, probably also on the, 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 the dose and frequency. How can we prevent and cope with this? Uh, one is uh, getting off, uh, get rid of the murine sequences that can be done by uh, transplanting the CDR regions like uh, have been done for several uh, therapeutic uh, antibodies. Uh, also, the, you can make chimeric antibodies and make uh, uh, cars of these or even uh, hyperchimeric antibodies in which you have really not the, the whole fat fragment but all, uh, only the CDR regions are transplanted. It can also be done by, by making uh, fully human single chain based cars and this can be uh, uh, made through phage pet platform, uh, uh, display platforms or transgenic mice um, and uh, at this moment the first of these human uh, cars uh, are entering the clinic and when you look at the, the, the percentage of um, the murine uh, uh, epitopes, it's, uh, this is zero, whereas here you have still uh, 30 or to 10 percent of murine epitopes in your, in your car. This is the list of uh, uh, humanized or uh, fully uh, uh, human cars uh, so far. Uh, several of them are in clinical evaluation. Um, yeah, we are just, uh, I think we have to wait and see whether we have here uh, a, a better uh, 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 immunogenicity and I, I really um, think that, that that will be. But the challenge when you look going to the fully human cars, the challenge is to find cars that have uh, an identical or even a better uh, binding property compared to the conventional immune cars. And, uh, uh, some of, 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 of this work, uh, especially this last uh, present, uh, publication by some of my, they, they looked for a CD, new CD19 cards through uh, FAB libraries and they compared uh, thousands of these FAB combinations to find especially uh, FABs that were uh, very most alike to the one that had of the murine uh, antibody. And uh, they uh, they realized to, to to find several of them, and these uh, and, uh, in antibody form, they had even better binding properties than the ones uh, than the CD19 itself. Uh, next, another thing is to to reduce uh, the immune competence of patients. That that what we saw in the turtle study. This is the cyclophosphamide only. This is the visafludarabin, and you see the difference in appearance of, of uh, uh, persistence of the T cells, also in the clinical outcome of these patients. So the intensified lymphodepletion reduced the anti car immune response, improved CAR T cell persistence and improved the clinical outcome. Take home messages of this presentation this afternoon will be that the CAR T cells are potentially strong immunogenic. I already uh, went through this, these uh, aspects, but how to prevent this then I think we should go for uh, reduce uh, and, and eliminate immunity of cars by humanizing them, especially uh, trying to find really human uh, cars. Uh, uh, and then uh, level, the level of immune competence we have to consider, uh, the dose frequency. And I think I didn't touch upon a lot, but also reduce the, the potential viral vector epitope transmission as we saw in our own study, but um, I think that's um, the message I want to give you for this afternoon. Thank you. So we have time uh, for a few questions for Dr. Lammers. Thanks for the talk, it was very informative. Um, I'm curious about ways of predicting this with in vitro systems. Are you do you think it's possible to screen enough PBMCs from patients or healthy donors to see these things before doing a two-month follow-up on a clinical study? Uh, 
Uh, you, you mean whether or not you have a, a predefined uh, uh, the frequency of these? Uh, uh... Or just whether there's a, a potential for a cellular response against one of these constructs? The, the, the <clears throat> Uh, there, there, are, there are lots of uh, ways of, of getting uh, uh, prediction of immunity, but uh, I, th I think uh, as long as you go for, for, for mouse, it is, it is really recognized, uh, no doubt at all. And uh, whether or not you, uh, you, you have an, uh, 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 yeah. you, you, for, 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 for epitopes for, for, example, for example, T cell receptors, there's another other thing. You, you can really go for uh, looking for uh, in epitope predictions, et cetera, et cetera, whether or not these are immunogenic. For example, in the, uh, in, in the Sommermeyer paper, uh, they looked not only at the FAP fragments, but also uh, on uh, the, the, the sequences that, that were at, at the boundary regions. And they, uh, they changed a little bit of the amino acids in such a way that these are uh, less uh, uh, immunogenic or uh, potentially immunogenic for, for the immune system. I think that that, that, that is a uh, fair way to go. But the, uh, uh, all mouse, anti uh, mouse antibodies will be recognized, definitely. And there is, yeah, you, you can try to screen in prior to that, but uh, you don't have to. You, you, will get it, you, will, you, you will get a response. I have like two questions, a uh, little bit related to PDL1. So usually, when you have immune response against cells, they tend to uh, upregulate molecules like PDL1. Do you see this kind of thing in those CAR cells? And they are T cells. So are they still susceptible to PDL1 downregulation? Uh, the, the CAR T cells itself, you mean? Yeah. Uh, there, it just depends on uh, they, they, when they are in the when when you generate them uh, and you look at them, their the PD1 expression is not too high, but when they come in in, in the body and they react upon, for example, in the CD19 uh, car uh, uh, trial, every T cell activation will also induce the expression of PD1. So they, 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 that might go up during, uh, during the phase that the cells are in the body. And when you generate immune response against them, do they upregulate PDL1? Uh, I'm not. I don't know. Uh, quick, quick, one quick question. Sorry, one quick question. Go ahead. Question about: Did you perform any of the T cell sequencing to see uh, the immune responses for? How we do the the, 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 the epitope mapping? You mean? Oh, so did you uh, perform any of the sequencing T cell receptor sequencing to identify more about how the responses or the immune response? No, we have not. Um, for the, the cars, we have we have done we have done, not done a prediction of our car, for example, to to, to, to get an idea how the cellular immune activity would would be. Um, it still might be possible to do, but uh, we just went for uh, looking at the epitopes that were recognized, uh, because when you when you're going for the uh, for, for for example for for the the, the hinge and, 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 and the fusion regions, there you, you, you can, can choose uh, uh, some extra uh, amino acids to, 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 to change it a little bit to, to, to prevent an, uh, yeah, the generation of an epitope uh, for, uh, for your T cells. But well, yeah, based on, on the, uh, uh, the actual antibody you use for making your, uh, your car, you, yeah, when you're going to change uh, epitopes over there, yeah, you might also introduce conformational changes in which you have no, uh, uh, after which you, you don't have a very good uh, recognition motive anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks, Corey. That was great. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Ann Gailey. Ann is um, associated with Geniton, also a research director at INSERM, and she's going to talk to us about uh, some of her work on immunogenicity of uh, AAV vector systems.
thank you for this uh, opportunity to present. Um, I would like to uh, discuss the immunogenicity of AV in the context of a, should I point? A very uh, favorable, of course, period right now for gene therapy with uh, many clinical successes of uh, gene therapy. So it's very enthusiastic. And uh, uh, the uh, AV vector, sorry, is a very important aspect of this uh, success for gene therapy. So um, AV, I shall remind uh, you, is actually a very, very small uh, particle, 26 nanometer in size, which uh, composed, is composed of the uh, capsid, the protein capsid. Uh, that is uh, containing a single-stranded or double-stranded uh, uh, DNA that's encoding the transgene and uh, is also uh, containing the uh, inverted time terminal repeat at the, uh, at the end of this, uh, of this sequence here. And um, the AV is uh, uh, derived from parvoviruses. It's uh, non-enveloped. It's uh, actually, uh, sorry, non-replicative. And uh, at this moment, there's been at least 13 natural and non-human uh, serotypes that have been identified for the capsid, plus many others that have been recently generated by engineering. And uh, I think it's important to remind uh, the audience that of all the different serotypes here, in fact, there are uh, different primary receptors that are used by these different serotypes, and I've just listed a few of them. And glycans are used to, in fact, determine the tropism of the uh, capsids. Um, and they are different from the different serotypes here. And there are also secondary receptors which are used by the particles for cellular uptake. And there's also an AV receptor which uh, for all of these serotypes here is actually really essential for the transduction. Uh, but it's not so clear if it's uh, regulating entry or traffic. And uh, all of these characteristics here determine the tropism uh, for these different serotypes for different tissues, which are uh, variable and, of course, uh, are uh, very useful for the different applications that one may want to make of these AV vectors. So, of course, there are uh, lots of advantages for uh, AV in terms of gene therapy because these are, uh, compared to adenoviruses, uh, uh, very non-inflammatory vectors. They are very well tolerized. They are not associated to disease. They are able to transduce uh, dividing or non-dividing cells, but in non-dividing cells, they are allowing uh, long-term transgene expression. They can be produced in uh, 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 helper-free systems. Um, it's also a very low uh, safety uh, level requirement for their production. And uh, they can be purified to separate the uh, DNA-containing particle or the empty capsids so that we have a high uh, specific activity preparation that can be used for gene therapy in a highly purified and uh, determined uh, form, even though, of course, all of these preparations contain uh, contaminants which can be then uh, uh, determined. So more, for more than 10 years now, AVs have been used in uh, clinical gene therapy as gene therapy vectors, and they've demonstrated very, very interesting uh, preliminary or even non-preliminary results in uh, diseases such as Parkinson or Leber's congenital amaurosis or hemophilia B. And the first uh, gene therapy drug that's been approved in Europe is Glybera, which is an AV1 that's uh, indicated for the treatment of lipoprotein lipase deficiency. So uh, the field is currently very active uh, for gene therapy with uh, uh, AV vector in the context of the treatment of uh, genetic disorders. And I've listed all the uh, currently ongoing uh, trials that are, are uh, found on clinicaltrials.gov. And you can see that there are a lot of ongoing trials in the eye or in the CNS using different serotype of AV, AV2 or 5 or 8 for the eye. AV2 and uh, AV uh, uh, resist 10 for, uh, or 9 for the CNS. And then in the other indication, there's other serotypes that are being used for the muscle. It's uh, either AV1 or uh, uh, resist 74 that's uh, being used uh, for uh, these applications. So it's a very active field and uh, many trials are ongoing. Uh, AV is also uh, not just used for gene transfer, it can be used also for gene editing and uh, in the future there will probably be a lot of application of AV, not only uh, to deliver the uh, gene editing uh, tools, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 for instance, but also because AV is a very good a donor template if you want to do knock-in with a CRISPR-Cas or with other types of uh, gene editing approach. Uh, the single-strand DNA of AV, in fact, is a preferred uh, template for uh, homologous directed repair. 
Uh, you can use these uh, long homology arms to do uh, the insertion. You can also uh, have a lot of uh, room for template design and conception, and there's a low spontaneous non-homologous end joining uh, background, which is very helpful. So it's also useful, even though uh, gene editing with AV um, and other tools is still used quite a lot ex vivo. In the future, it might be very interesting to also use AV for in vivo gene editing. And uh, there are several reviews recently that uh, can give you an overview of this uh, particular field. The big problem with AV is its immunogenicity. Uh, immunogenicity at two levels. First of all, because there are pre-existing antibodies or neutralizing antibodies against AV capsids, which make it ineligible in many, uh, many individuals. The second thing is that, in fact, in injecting AV into an individual will induce immune responses, and uh, these will be immune responses to the capsid or to the transgene protein that's encoded, and in the transgene positive cells that will then be rejected potentially, which then will create toxicity or loss of therapeutic efficacy. So this is really problematic. And the very big problem, of course, is the existence of pre-existing uh, seropositivity to AV capsids. Uh, it is actually very prevalent. It goes between 70 to 20 percent of the population depending on the serotypes. Some serotypes are much less immunogenic or have less seroprevalence than others in different populations. This is also very variable uh, across the world. But these neutralizing antibodies tend to cross-react with one another I mean, with the different capsids, so it's uh, also really problematic. Uh, even in newborns, you can have uh, antibodies which are transmitted by the mother, and uh, so treating young children might also be a problem. And uh, these antibodies interfere with the entry or with post-entry mechanism of AV life cycle. Uh, they can also induce all of the uh, opsonization or ADCC or phagocytosis-related uh, uptake of the uh, the particles themselves or the cells that have captured them. And even very low titers are sufficient to, in fact, prevent transduction. So it's really a big problem. And a lot of people have actually worked to try to define those epitopes in the, this is a composite picture of uh, the AV capsids of different serotypes that is showing the different uh, epitopes that have been identified uh, and are recognized by a variety of different antibodies uh, that have been characterized. So, of course, you can use certain routes in the brain or on the eye. The particles are much less likely to encounter antibodies. And that's also probably why this uh, particular vector is used very much in these types of application. This is a very active field of research. I'm not going to talk very much about it. I will talk about this other problem, which is the induction of immune response when you administer the AV. And um, in mice, so this has been really a big surprise in the field, you know, 10 years ago, but um, in fact, this is because this was not really very well predicted by the animal models. Even though if you look carefully at in mice, uh, the T cell immune response to the capsid is in fact seen. You need those T cell responses, and they are in fact MYD88 dependent, they depend on innate immune signal to control the type of antibodies that you induce in the mice. But in gene therapy trials in mice, um, the induction of these neutralizing antibodies is seen when you inject AV, other than in the eye, for instance. And uh, in some patients, uh, cytotoxic T cells against the capsid have been uh, identified. This has been, for instance, seen in the factor IX trial that have been reported. And you can see the elevation of liver transaminase, which are now taken as a very uh, important biomarkers of the induction of this cytolytic and cellular response against the capsid. And it's watched very carefully in all these trials now. You can detect, of course, with tetramer or with pentamer, the existence of the CD8 capsid-specific T cells, and you can and measure that in patients. So there's been a lot of reports, on, and, and so of course monitored very carefully in all the different trials that use AV in man. Uh, it's not that surprising, actually. There's nothing really special about AV that would prevent it from being recognized by all the elements of the immune system. In fact, we know that once administered into the organism, AV will encounter a number of different elements, such as, for instance, in the first place, all of the uh, soluble proteins that compose the innate immune system, for instance, the complement, which is known to bind AV capsids. It will also encounter all kinds of phagocytes as well as antigen presenting cells, and these will actually present uh, these uh, components uh, of the capsid protein in particular to T cells, CD4, CD8 T cells, and uh, that will generate B cell responses. So um, it's very important to think about all of these different elements, thinking, trying to understand what could be immunogenic in AV, how to uh, understand how it works, and how to avoid that. 
So there's a number of different elements uh, around the vector itself that need to be taken into account. The presence of the viral genome, uh, which in fact, of course, is not a protein, but it's a very important element in terms of potential activation of the innate immune system and uh, its structure is very important for that. The presence of the transgene product, uh, which is transcribed in the cells that are infected and uh, is synthesized in the transduced cells, including the antigen presenting cells that in fact have taken it up and are infected with this uh, particle. The capsid, which is made of protein, it is present in transduced cells, but it's not synthesized, so it will be in fact degraded. It's uptaken and, and treated in a very different pathway as the transgene product. Contaminants, again, I've uh, mentioned that could be part of the uh, sort of adjuvant effect. And of course, there are other aspects such as route, dose, and schedule, which need to be taken into account. So all of these things need to be studied. Now, um, I will focus the rest of my talk on uh, murine models. Of course, it's, it's, it, we know very well that murine models are not perfect to study and understand what's going on in mice but uh, there are in fact not very many models that can be used to really try to understand the complexity of these immune responses and try to make sense out of it. One thing that um, I decided to focus on really is the interaction between the AV and antigen presenting cells and in particular professional antigen presenting cells. There are other antigen presenting cells but those that express MHC class 2 and are particularly well um, uh, equipped to deal with uh, the uptake of antigen, the processing and presentation both to CD4 and CD8 T cells are called these professional antigen presenting cells. So you have the conventional dendritic cells, plasmid site to eat dendritic cells, monocyte macrophages which can in fact have different subphenotypes and can mature, and then the B lymphocytes. So um, to study that actually we have worked in mice with uh, different tools. First of all, we've actually studied um, how uh, AV particles interact with APCs by using uh, fluorescently labeled particles as well as a completely inert, same size and roughly same charge kind of polystyrene uh, nanoparticles that we can use as controls. So these are injected to mice. One hour later, the uh, lymphoid organs are digested, the uh, different antigen presenting cells the dendritic cells, monocytes, and B cells are then uh, purified by uh, various techniques and then they're incubated with uh, T cells that are specific for uh, an antigen that we have actually put on the particles and this is the male murine antigen called HY. Then we wait and then we look at what's happening. We've also used uh, AV particles in which we've inserted this uh, HY antigen in the capsid. We've used, in fact, the CD4 peptide DBY, which allows us to read out the uh, CD4 T cell response, so it's inserted in the AV VP1 uh, uh, region of the uh, AV1 capsid. We're also uh, putting the uh, DBY um, uh, tag in the transgene so we can read out how the transgene is then being processed and presented to CD4, CD8 T cells. And the first thing that uh, is interesting to see is that in vivo, the interactions of AV1 with the APCs in mice are in fact not random. They are selectively enriched. For instance, in spleen cells, the CD11B monocytes interact very, very uh, preferentially um, in a much higher way with AV1 than the nanospheres or uh, any of the other um, uh, subpopulations. And if you subdivide the CD11C positive subpopulation uh, to look a little bit more in detail because there's in fact a little preference, it's not so easy to see compared to the higher level of the monocyte. But within the CD11C population, we can subdivide these cells into the CD8 alpha positive uh, dendritic cell population that's uh, uh, very equipped for the cross priming capacity, the CD11B, CD11C double positive population, or the PDCA uh, plasma cytoid subpopulation. And you can see that primarily the CD8 alpha is interacting very well with uh, the uh, AV once it's injected in vivo. In the CD11B uh, monocyte population, it's the F480 macrophagic population that in fact interacts very well, but also the GR1 high population interacts well. We've looked uh, elsewhere than the spleen in the liver, and we find also that the F480 and the C11P population interacts very quickly and very rapidly at high level with the, uh, with the AV. So um, 
how does that work in terms of the capsid immune response? So what we've done is we've uh, taken some mice in which we have depleted uh, the different populations of dendritic cells using a diphtheria toxin system. So when we looked at the capsid CD40 cell response, we see that if we remove the CD11C dendritic cells, we actually have a much reduced response of T cells in these mice that lack this population. And if we inject the vector to the mice, take out the T cell, sorry, the dendritic cells, CD11C, or the monocytes, or the B cells, and then reincubate them with the T cells, we can see that only the CD11C actually trigger the T cell response. So there's a very clear uh, ability of the CD11C dendritic cells to actually uh, present the capsid to T cells. And in terms of transgene, same exercise, we deplete the CD11C cells and we can also demonstrate that they are very important for the transgene response. And when we do this ex vivo um, uh, transfer, uh, first inject the vector, then get the APC and then put the APC with T cells, you can see that both the uh, CD11C dendritic cells and the monocytes then can present the transgene. So there are differences in between capsid presentation or transgene presentation to T cell depending on what kind of APC you're using. And uh, it is interesting also to know that this is determined by the, uh, basically the, the entry mechanism, the glycan specificity. So AV1 is using N-linked sialic acid to uh, recognize the, the, the to, to bind to cells. So this can be uh, treated by neuraminidase to be removed and you can see that actually by doing that you remove the capacity to present the capsid or the transgene in the different population of cells, meaning that the uh, same uh, specificities, molecular specificities that uh, trigger or determine the binding of AV are also important for their binding to the antigen presenting cells. What we've seen also is that injecting AAV to mice triggers a mobilization of APC into lymphoid node, in lymph nodes, sorry, and in, in, in the spleen. And uh, if we compare the activation of the cells that have been, in fact, um, been mobilized or that are present in lymphoid organ, and we look at a panel of different uh, uh, activation marker, we can uh, see that, in fact, these activation marker and this kind of stimulation is very similar to what we can get, in fact, with just the uh, uh, inert nanoparticles. And it's different from LPS, which then triggers a very different level of activation, or PBS that, of course, does not activate the cell. So there is a kind of level of uh, nanoparticulate uh, uh, level of activation of the APC that is independent of uh, a kind of innate immune signal that's mediated by cytokine, but is probably determined by the, uh, the, the particulate nature of, of, the, of, the, of the vector. So this is summarized here that shows that, in fact, different kinds of APCs use, and I'm summarizing, in fact, a lot of data that I'm not presenting here, but that have been published in the papers that have been mentioned in these different slides, uh, that they actually, uh, these different antigen-presenting cells use different types of uh, linkage uh, to uh, allow the entry of uh, AV1. Uh, they bind AV uh, in specific subpopulation, mainly the CD8 alpha dendritic cells for the dendritic population or the F4 AT macrophage. The B cells in vivo, curiously, do not bind AV, whereas in vitro, we can see very clear binding of AV to B cells. So I would like to alert you, in fact, on the danger, so to speak, of predicting interaction between AV and different sub cell subtypes in vitro versus in vivo. Uh, we have uh, several evidence uh, in different experiments where B cells really react very differently to AV than any of the other APCs. And uh, what's interesting is that the B cells do not present capsid or transgene. The dendritic cell present both, and the macrophage monocytes essentially present the transgene. So what's uh, going on in a real model? How can we uh, sort of um, try to integrate all this uh, information in a real gene therapy model, for instance, in a, uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophy? So LGMD2D is uh, linked to the uh, deficit in alpha sarcoglycan, which is a member of sarcoglycan dystroglycan complex at the surface of skeletal myofibers. And mice which are deficient into this uh, alpha sarcoglycan moiety, um, in fact, have a completely destabilized complex, and they lack also beta sarcoglycan, and they lack expression of the, uh, the whole complex here, uh, which means that the fibers are very poorly resistant to stretch, and uh, there is also a very uh, strong infiltration 
uh, uh, into the um, skeletal muscle that you can see here with Evans blue staining, which indicates a high permeability of the tissue. Now, uh, my colleagues uh, at Genito have uh, tried a long time ago to do gene therapy uh, in psychoglycan deficient mice. They have taken the psychoglycan transgene into an AV and uh, tried to uh, put this into the psychoglycan uh, knockout mice. And what they see is that if they use a CMV promoter to get a very strong expression of this transgene protein, which is a transmembrane protein, uh, they actually get a quick expression, but then it's lost with the CD8 infiltration in the tissue. But when they use a muscle, a skeletal muscle tissue, uh, quote unquote, specific promoter, the C512 promoter, they can get a very nice expression and much less CD8 infiltration. So that really suggests that, in fact, the control of tissue specific expression and potentially the lack of exposure of this transgene to the immune system is probably a very important element in the ability to maintain this transgenic protein at the surface of the muscle fibers. So we've decided to test this uh, question with um, uh, much more regulated uh, expression system using microRNA regulated vectors. And of course, uh, this microRNA regulation system uh, and this review uh, shows very nicely all different microRNAs which have been used uh, in uh, expression uh, vectors. There's more than 30 now that have been used in different constructs to try to regulate gene expression. We worked with the microRNA 142.3p, which was identified uh, by Brian Brown in Luigi Naldini's lab. And this uh, microRNA is specifically expressed in cells of hematopoietic origin. So when this microRNA is expressed uh, and present in the cells, uh, if you in fact have introduced in your construct the targets of this microRNA, then the RNA will be destroyed and degraded. Whereas in the microRNA uh, 142.3p negative cells, such as muscle cell or other type of cell of non-hematopoietic origin, in spite of the presence of these uh, targets into your uh, vector, then you will have no degradation and the transgene will be expressed. So uh, we have, of course, used this with uh, the psychoglycan system, and I just want to spend two minutes to explain that, in fact, to follow transgene expression, we've tagged the transgene with this HY murine male antigen sequences in the C-terminal part, which is the intracytoplasmic part. We've inserted the DBY, which is the CD4 T-cell uh, matrix class 2 epitope, or the UTY, which is the class 1 CD8 epitope, and we've verified that actually that does not impair the expression of the psychoglycan protein, the psychoglycan HY protein is expressed like the psychoglycan native one, and it restores in the knockout mice the uh, whole complex at the surface, the alpha, but also the beta and the dystrophin expression, as you would expect. So uh, if you inject mice with either the AV that expressing the uh, uh, CMV-driven uh, psychoglycan HY, in green, in green here, you inject that into mice, and then you recover the spleen antigen presenting cells, either the CD11C or the CD11B monocyte population, and you co-culture these APCs with um, T cells that are specific for HY. And you can see a beautiful uh, presentation and a beautiful upregulation of the T cell uh, response, depending on how many APCs you put in the culture. If you have injected the mice with the microRNA regulated vector, both in the CD11C or in the CD11B population, you completely suppress the ability to present the transgene to T cells. So it's a very good, very strong, and in fact, it allows us to look at different subpopulations of APCs and, and verify the absence of um, antigenic presentation. So if we use this uh, microRNA regulated uh, vector uh, in mice, in use, we use that, for instance, to start with in normal black six mice, you can see that if you inject the CMV-driven uh, transgene, we get a huge immune response. You can see here, in fact, compared to PBS-injected muscle that's all nice and, and full of nicely uh, nice fibers, you can see here that there's a huge infiltration and a big destruction of, uh, of fibers. Just using the microRNA target in the construct is enough to, in fact, give you a very significant protection and, uh, and uh, amelioration of the uh, structure of the muscle that you've injected. Uh, if you look at the transgene expression, you look, uh, for instance, in black, in the uh, levels of transgene that you can ob obtain with the uh, CMV-driven construct with no regulation. At eight days, you have beautiful level of expression, but then it goes down very quickly with time, and then you have lost completely transgene expression. Just having the targets here maintains the transgene expression over time for a long time. 
And uh, this is linked to the absence of CD8 and CD4 T cell response that we've uh, shown. So this works actually very well in terms of controlling the expression of the transgene, much better actually than uh, tissue-specific transgene um, uh, promoters. For instance, we've tested the Desmin promoter, which is better than the CMV, of course, but uh, in fact, it's still uh, better regulated with the presence of uh, microRNA targets. One problem, however, is that this works very, very nicely in normal black six mice, but it does not work with uh, sarcoglycan knockout mice. In sarcoglycan knockout mice, so in B6, we maintain transgene over time, but with the sarcoglycan, even uh, with the microRNA, we keep losing the transgene. It's maintained up to 14 days, but then it drops down. And you can see clearly here, very nice expression of the restored sarcoglycan here, but then infiltration of the tissue and uh, then loss of the transgene positive cells. And um, what's really interesting is that uh, we were able then to follow the uh, effect on antigenic presentation because one possibility was that, in fact, this uh, microRNA was not able to function in the sarcoglycan deficient mice. After all, these mice are sick. Maybe they are not, uh, you know, the, uh, there are lots of cytokines and they dysregulate the expression of the microRNA. So what we did is, in fact, we injected the two different vectors. We collected the uh, APCs and then incubated them with uh, CFE sustained CD4 T cells that are specific. And what you can see here is in gray the uh, level of division. So, in fact, if you have the peak here, it means that the T cells don't divide, so they don't respond. They, there's no antigenic priming or presentation. And uh, in uh, black is the line with the uh, um, is the line with the uh, microRNA uh, regulated vector. So you can see that at day five, five days after the injection of the vector, you get some level of T cell proliferation in the sarcoglycan deficient mice and also in the B6 mice. But that level, in fact, is protected by the macroRNA. So there is, in fact, a good level of protection and prevention of the antigenic presentation. However, at day eight, what you see, in fact, is that the uh, B6 is still capable of protecting, but the sarcoglycan knockout mice, there's an escape, and in fact, the macroRNA regulated vector is no longer able to protect, and there is, again, presentation to the T cells. So we see that, again, very well when we uh, adoptively transfer into mice that have received the different vectors, we adoptively transfer uh, T cells that are specific for the transgene. And uh, you can see here that you get a very nice peak of proliferation of the CD4 T cells around six days after you've injected the vector, when you've injected the non-regulated vector. And in the sarcoglycan deficient mice, you get that both with the regulated and non-regulated vector, there's just a, a shift in time. You get proliferation later when you have regulated, but you still get T cell activation. So um, it's very important. Uh, the CD4 T cells are playing a major role, in fact, in this immune response to the transgene in this context. And we have crossed the sarcoglycan uh, deficient mice with a number of different strains to really pinpoint and confirm that the CD4 T cells were at the center of this problem. So if we use CD4 knockout mice uh, crossed with the sarcoglycan or not, we in fact completely prevent the uh, uh, presentation of the transgene. Same thing with MHC class two knockout mice. And in fact, contrary to what we had thought, uh, if we dispense of the CD8 cells or if we dispense of the MHC class 1 presentation using beta-2M knockout mice or if we dispense for B cells, we don't get any effect. So really the CD4 cells are actually at the, at the heart of, of the problem here in terms of the uh, transgene response and transgene presentation. And um, there is also a very, as I showed you, a very strong infiltration of uh, cells in the muscles when there's the rejection of the transgene positive cells. And this infiltrate is composed in particular of myeloid cells. And there's a very strong population of F480 macrophages. And we also have found various subsets of M1 or M2 macrophages in this muscle. And uh, the uh, CD4 cells uh, are uh, very important you know, to in maintain this infiltrate. We was, were wondering, in fact, if it's not the CD8 cells that are actually killing or responsible for killing the, uh, uh, the fibers, could it be those myeloid cells that are, in fact, are uh, perpetuating the degradation of the transgene? So we use clodronate to remove myeloid cells in the muscles when we have the immune response. 
And this had only a very partial uh, effect, even though we were uh, able to demonstrate that we had the complete removal or very strong removal of the myeloid cells. But this uh, did not really completely prevent the development or the loss of transgene. So there's other things, but the myeloid cells are part of it, the CD4 are part of it, but it's not uh, exclusively the myeloid cells that are doing that. So what we see is that the cellular composition and the effector mechanisms involved in the destruction of the transgene uh, uh, are very different from between normal and dystrophic muscle. Uh, there's direct antigenic presentation in healthy tissue, but in dystrophic tissue, we have in fact very complex mechanisms for priming and activation of the cells, and that the CD4 cells play a major role for uh, the activation of the CD8 cells, but also for the myeloid cell infiltration and the inflammation and the tissue repair. So to put this into drawings, what we have here is that when we have AV uh, gene transfer, we transfer muscle tissue, but we also transfer populations of APCs. These populations of APCs are in some cases activated to migrate and to be mobilized into uh, the secondary lymphoid organs where they mature, migrate, and present the transgene to the T cells, CD4, CD8, and to the B cells. And then they generate a B cell response to the transgene, but also a T cell expansion function. So if we use the microRNA or if we prevent expression of the transgene into the antigen presenting cells, we only transduce the tissues, for instance, the, the muscle, and then we prevent all this aspect here. So the immune response in the, in the lymphoid organ is much reduced. We do see the uh, activation of regulatory T cells. Uh, and in fact, we do see that whether or not we have an immune response. We think that in fact, when we have a lack of effector response, the regulatory population in fact becomes uh, more balanced and perhaps plays a role also to maintain transgene tolerance. But there's no active tolerance. When we re-challenge the muscles with peptides after we've in fact used this regulatory system, we don't have a permanent tolerance to the transgene. So it's, uh, it's, it's maintained, it's expressed, but it's, there's not an active tolerance and we can re-immunize the mice. Now in uh, a dystrophic muscle, however, having a destruction of an inflammation of the muscle where there's a release of uh, after transduction of the transgene the transgene, in fact, is not expressed in the APCs, but the APCs can then pick it up from the destroyed muscle and then represent it at a later time, bring it to the, to the lymphoid organs, and then prime the T cells and have the amplification loop. So this is uh, what I've shown you in the sarcoglycan deficient mice, but we've also seen that in the MDX mouse model. So there is an inability for the system to completely control all of these aspects. And of course, it's known that in the muscle, there's a lot of uh, innate uh, signals. Innate signals which are linked to the activation of cytokines, but also the production of what's called sterile inflammation, molecular, uh, uh, molecular patterns, the dumps, which in fact are uh, creating and activating a number of different cells, including capillaries, that in fact uh, uh, promote a lot of uh, uh, infiltration in the interstitial space. Uh, in, uh, and uh, in fact also attract immune cells and uh, uh, through the capillary leaks. And uh, this in fact contributes to the uh, activation of the inflammasome and uh, with the activation of NF-kappa B, also in activation of a type 1 interferon type response. So this has been described into dystrophic muscle and we think that in fact it's playing an important role here in the dystrophic uh, immune response with AV where it's activating all of the signals, including the uh, CD4 and the myeloid cell loop that is uh, so powerful to uh, contribute together to the destruction of the muscle and the priming of the response. So uh, I'd like also to remind you that not only we have this transgene immune response in the form of T cell response, we have also antibodies to the transgene. We have also T cell and antibodies to the capsid that are, or, that are also triggered by AV gene transfer. And we demonstrated, in fact, that the T cell response uh, to the capsid is dependent on MYD88, which is an adaptator that is absolutely essential for a lot of the innate uh, immune uh, response. It is also using TLR9, TLR9, which is very important, for, especially for the TH1 differentiation of these uh, capsid-specific T cells. In contrast, the B cell response to the capsid is very different. It's only dependent on MYD88. It is not dependent on TLR9. 
And uh, I was very pleased to find that, in fact, a recent paper by uh, Roland Elzor Group, Roger Zetal, that just uh, was published last year in the uh, Journal of Innate Immunity, confirmed these findings and also determined the different uh, uh, innate mechanisms for the anti-transgene immune response, where they also found that the B cell response to the transgene is dependent on MYD88, but not on the any of the other TLR. Whereas, in fact, the T cell response is dependent on MYD88, TLR9, and is going through the type 1 interferon cascade. So clearly, we have multiple mechanisms, and the B cells seem to have a, a B cell autonomous innate uh, signaling pathway that's very important to take into account. Finally, um, I just go very quickly, but there's this issue of rot and dose, and uh, there are also a lot of recent papers that have examined this question. And that's interesting to see that actually with respect to the innate signaling, recent paper has shown that if you administer AAV, either in one minute, 10 minutes, or 90 minutes, you get very different response in the, here in macaques, where you look at the IL-6 induction, and this in fact has a sort of very strong impact on the ability to express the transgene. So I think this is something that needs to be also taken into account. The uh, capacity to which the AV is given is seen by the different APC at what time, when, and also perhaps uh, does it have time to go and trigger all of the non-professional APCs which are the counterpart of what I've just talked about. And there are some stromal cells which are uh, also uh, perhaps capable of tolerizing. And this would be very interesting to study in this context. So uh, just to conclude, um, I'd like to said that in fact the immune responses to AV gene transfer are very complex, uh, but they are very readily observed in preclinical models, even though we know that they don't necessarily match what we will see in humans, but I think we have to take into account the fact that this complexity will probably be found also at the level of the uh, human uh, subjects. They are both innate and adaptive immune responses that are important. They involve antibody T cells and they use different pathways. So blocking this immune response will require multiple checkpoints, which will be even more complex to regulate when you have a pathogenic tissue. So um, there are, of course, many important questions about what to use to block this immune response, immunosuppression, um, uh, immunomodulation, anti-inflammation, a combination of all of that. I would have liked to bring you some solution, but um, some of the things we tried have not worked. But my colleague Federico Mingozzi is talking tomorrow at the education section, and he might be proposing some uh, things uh, that are interesting. Um, there's also, of course, the uh, possibility to try to induce specific uh, uh, immune tolerance to the transgene. And again, there are many uh, different aspects uh, that can be considered for that. So I think also that B cells are really unique, um, unique cells, and they play a unique role, I think, in response to AAV. And there are reviews that have listed a number of different approaches that can be used for the control of humoral responses to AV. I would like also to remind to use the, to think about the host characteristics. We've talked about the pathogenic aspect, but think also in terms of uh, the genetic aspect. Of course, the fact that the host may or not, may not be tolerant to the transgene, depending on the mutation of uh, the disease, also the age. Clearly, if you have a subject in which the pathology has not had time to establish itself and to uh, destroy the tissue, of course, you will have a very different response than in an uh, aged subject. And uh, this is pretty obvious. So, uh, last slide is uh, whether or not we. Yeah, that, with, this, this, yeah quickly, because you're okay. half minutes over. All right. Ideal vector for gene therapy. Um, I think that as many um, people are in fact uh, redesigning AV to try to uh, uh, retarget the tropism and change the specificity for the different tissues, perhaps it would be nice to think about in fact integrating into this strategy a real uh, strategy to try to uh, select AV that have specifically uh, low immunogenic properties and they should be designed to in fact uh, reduce uh, antigenic presentation to T cells by controlling of course transgene expression and uh, they selected perhaps the capsid against their ability to bind uh, professional APCs, even though of course it's difficult because they will use the same um, uh, glycans to enter the cells. Perhaps also try to reduce the CD4 activation potential by reducing the TLR9 uh, activation capacity by selectively uh, using CPG-free uh, constructs uh, perhaps ask the question about the self-complementary DNA and the ITR uh, motifs that could be recognized. And then I have something that's minimally activity, activating for APCs uh, in terms of the particulate structure, purity, and also uh, I want to caution uh, 
uh, for the future use of gene editing since uh, this may actually trigger perhaps uh, some innate uh, pathways that we uh, don't still know about. Anyway, I'm done, and I would like to acknowledge uh, in my lab uh, Florence Bogero and Maxime Ferrand and Sylvie Darocha who've done a lot of the experiments I presented, and then the uh, vector core facility of Nantes that provided the vector, and then all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. So we uh, just don't have time for questions. If people can just uh, reconnoiter with Anne afterward, that would be great. Thanks. And just uh, our, our final speaker is uh, David Russell. Uh, David's going to talk about uh, probably an even bigger challenge in, uh, uh, in cell therapy, uh, where attempts are being made to engraft allogeneic cells across MHC barriers and some of the strategies that uh, his lab and, and company uh, are thinking about uh, in that vein. Thanks, Andy. Um, so the title of my talk is Avoiding Rejection of Allogeneic Cell Therapies. Um, next slide. Thanks. Um, so I broke it down into three big areas uh, to try and give some perspective. Obviously, we've been transplanting organs for a long time and learned about HLA matching and immunosuppressive therapies, and I'm not going to talk about that more today. Uh, there's been a lot of work in adult cell transplantation, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, today. As advantages of this approach is that the therapeutic cell types are easily harvested from the donors, uh, but the, the disadvantages are that there's limited ex vivo manipulation that's possible. Generally, you can't clone the cells when they're adult cells, and they're going to senesce, so that limits what you can do with these cells. And I'd like to spend most of the talk on pluripotent stem cell-derived products. Um, these have major advantages in that they have unlimited proliferative potential. You can do all the cloning and genetic manipulation that you would like. Uh, and I guess a disadvantage would be that you still have to differentiate them into something therapeutic, and that is not a trivial matter. Um, next slide. So just to review the pluripotent stem cell, that's embryonic stem cell or induced pluripotent stem cells. And the reason this has really changed the field of cell therapy is that you can grow these cells forever and do all the genetic manipulation you want while they're in the pluripotent state. You can then differentiate them into virtually any cell type in the body. They can be used to treat diseases of all organ systems, uh, so they have vast potential in medicine. Next slide. So why not just use autologous cells? Uh, there are really several reasons why this is hard to do. Um, first off, person-to-person -person variation makes it difficult to get a controlled uh, outcome all the time. Uh, there's difficult regulatory issues if you have to get every lot of cells from every patient approved by regulatory agencies over and over again. Uh, logistical problems in treating patients. Some of these CAR therapies, for example, that use autologous cells, you might have to harvest the cells from a patient, put it on overnight FedEx to the place where you do the, the gene therapy and FedEx it back the next day and hope the patient's still there and that the plane showed up. These logistical problems are very difficult when you want to treat lots of patients in lots of places. Uh, it can get extremely expensive. And all these issues are even more complex when you start talking about autologous induced pluripotent stem cells, which of course have been highly touted as a way to solve the problem of allogeneic rejection. So if you imagine you're going to harvest an adult cell, a bone marrow cell or a fibroblast, turn it into an induced pluripotent stem cell outside of the body, expand that cell, do whatever genetic engineering you need to do, differentiate that cell into a therapeutic product, and then eventually go back into the same individual. You're talking many months, typically, of high-level research. Could cost many hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is just not going to be scaled up to any large degree. Next slide. But the real problem when you're trying to use allogeneic cells is HLA or MHC, and you have the class one molecules uh, which are present on almost all somatic cells. They present peptide antigens to CD8 cells, this is HLA, B, and C, uh, and these are important to match in cell therapies. And there's also class II molecules, uh, which present antigens to CD4 cells, and they're mainly expressed on specialized antigen-presenting cells, so they're not such an issue for every type of therapy, but I will say that a lot of other cell types will upregulate class II molecules in the presence of inflammation which is usually the situation when you're doing the therapy. Uh, 
So there might turn out to be an issue as well. Next slide. So I broke it down into four types of solutions that I'd like to talk about today. Uh, as I mentioned, one of these is not really allogeneic, but people have proposed it, is to make iPSCs out of every single individual. And I already mentioned that this is probably not going to be uh, scaled up to any large degree. It, it clearly has an advantage in that there's no immunosuppression required, and, and each um, patient will have their own cell line that's perfectly matched, but it takes months to prepare lots of money to uh, make, uh, difficult to get it approved by regulatory agencies, and every single cell line you make is going to have to be optimized as you differentiate it into other cell types. So it's a big problem. Um, next slide. Uh, another approach is to use HLA matched, HLA mismatched wild type cells. So just don't bother to match HLA and take a wild type cell that we have. The advantage, of course, is that only one cell line would be required. The disadvantages are that, it, that immune suppression is also going to be required, most likely, and rejection would still be possible. Of course, these cells can be produced right away. They're cheap. Uh, you only have to get one cell line approved by a regulatory agency, and only one has to be differentiated. So in fact, they're already being used in the clinic in a lot of the initial trials for pluripotent stem cells. So they do have major advantages. And a couple more points on that. Um, Yes, next slide, thanks. Um, so people have used allogeneic adult cell therapies for quite a while using mismatched cells. Um, a lot of these are based on mesenchymal stem cells or other cell types, and in general when they're mismatched, the expectation is those cells are eventually going to get rejected after they've carried out whatever therapeutic effect was intended. So we don't really need to worry about overcoming allogeneic rejection in that setting. Other cases, for example, hematopoietic stem cells, it's a major part of the whole therapy, is how do we keep these cells from getting rejected if they're not a perfect HLA match. And one approach is immunosuppressive drugs um, that most people get uh, when they're trying to get HLA mismatched cells to survive, but of course there are serious problems with these drugs. They, you can, patients will get cancers, they'll get infections, that can be life-threatening. And another problem that's not appreciated so much is that if you're working with a pluripotent stem cell derived product, often there's sort of a terminal stage of differentiation that would occur in vivo after transplantation, and this can be affected by steroids and other drugs that might be used for immunosuppression, so it complicates the issue. Uh, people have also proposed just transplanting into immune privileged sites like the brain, the spinal cord, the eye, um, the idea being that the cells will survive there, and that certainly is a possibility, and there's already trials underway uh, both in the eye and in the spinal cord with pluripotent stem cell derived products that are ca capitalizing on that approach. And finally, a fourth approach is to tolerize a patient, get them to accept that new HLA type ahead of time, and then whatever graft you put in will not be rejected. Next slide. We don't know how well all these uh, approaches are going to work, but there is some data out there. Uh, there's a very nice paper recently published about transplanting pluripotent stem cell-derived retinal pigmented epithelial cells to treat, which is used to treat a AMD, uh, macular degeneration. And they, it has proposed that it's an immune privilege site and the cells won't be rejected. And this Japanese group actually made um, non-human primate iPSCs and differentiated them into RPE and transplanted MHC matched and MHC mismatched recipients. And what they did find was that when it was mismatched, even in the eye, they would get inflammation in the retinas. You could find uh, antigen presenting cells invading. You could find T cells invading. And that was not the case in MHC matched. So immune privilege may partly help, but it's probably not going to be the whole story. You might still need to match. And part of that equation might be when you're doing the surgeries to put the cells in, you, of course, break down the blood-brain barrier and everything gets exposed right away. So that's sort of built into the whole process to begin with. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, another approach is to tolerate the recipient so that they'll accept the new HLA types. And that's been proposed for a long time. And we know that people that have hematopoietic chimeras, where they have two different... Uh, hematopoietic stem cell HLA types that are in the same individual, they will accept organs uh, that have the other HLA type. The problem with that strategy is that it's very difficult to make a hematopoietic stem cell and make a chimera uh, that will then accept another graft, for example, a cardiac graft or a, a neuron graft after that. 
So although it's been proposed, it's really been hard to pull off, at least with a pluripotent stem cell. This recent paper that just came out actually has a, has a nice solution to that problem, which is to make a, a regulatory dendritic cell out of the pluripotent stem cell, administer that to the recipient, that will induce tolerance, and then later on you could go back in with the graft of another cell type. So in this experiment they did a cardiac graft that was mismatched in the, in the recipients. This is done in mice. And when they had a primary immunization with an iPS-derived dendritic cell, the graft was accepted and there was no immune infiltrate. So a very nice study. It may bring back this possibility of tolerizing because we now no can make uh, these regulatory dendritic cells more easily out of a pluripotent stem cell, allowing this field to move forward. Next slide. And other approaches to make a bank of HLA-type cells. And of course, that's been done for bone marrow and hematopoietic stem cells for a long time. You can need up to millions of different donors to cover all the HLA types that are out there. Um, but it still can be done if you really commit yourself to it and put this bank together. Um, you may still need some immune suppression because people won't be perfect matches and you've got minor histocompatibility antigens to worry about. It takes many years to prepare such a bank, so it's not trivial. And of course, as with the iPSCs, the cost is high. You've got lots of cell lines to make. You've got, they've all got to be approved by the FDA. If they're complicated to make, that's difficult. And if you're going to differentiate a pluripotent stem cell, each cell line will have to be optimized in terms of the protocol, which often can take many weeks or even months before you get the therapeutic product. Um, next slide. But even with those um, problems, people are going ahead and doing this. Uh, next slide. Uh, and the, the trick really that sort of makes it seem almost reasonable is if you use HLA homozygous cells, because there you don't need millions. You only have to match one haplotype to the individual, and if you pick common haplotypes and, for example, just worry about HLA A, B, and DR, you can make homozygous lines, if you made 50 homozygous lines of the most common haplotypes, you'd match more than half the population. And in some countries you might even need fewer lines, for example, Japan, where you have less HLA diversity. So this is getting into the realm of reasonable when you start to get down to those numbers. Uh, and several groups are trying to generate iPSCs from HLA homozygous individuals that are found in the population to generate an HLA homozygous cell bank of iPSCs that will ultimately be used in allogeneic therapies. Of course, you can imagine it's going to be hard to find HLA homozygous individuals at these rarer haplotypes. Uh, and it's going to be difficult to really get the whole uh, the whole bank prepared. Um, so another option is to actually engineer HLA homozygous cells. Next slide, which is a study that we did a few years ago. Um, and the idea here is you've got all the HLA molecules together on the short arm of chromosome 6, all the genes. Um, we'd like to convert that to homozygosity in the cells and create HLA homozygous lines. So here you could have a cell line that has two HLA chromosomes, two different chromosomes and a haplotypes. Uh, you then create two different versions of HLA homozygous cells from them, and you could conceivably get some of those rare haplotypes to homozygosity. The idea is you take an AAV editing vector, you insert a um, high-tech gene, just centromeric to the HLA genes. You can select for that editing event with hygromycin. You then select for a mitotic recombination event that occurs centromeric to that, for, by selecting for loss of TK with gancyclovir, and you can generate HLA homozygous cells that we showed with the SNP chip that they had actually had a crossover here and were homozygous from there on out. Um, so it is possible to do that, but once again, it's not trivial, it's a lot of work, and we're talking about a lot of lines, and ultimately it's not clear to me that even the HLA homozygous bank will find a lot of applications. Next slide. Clearly the most powerful approach would be to have a universal donor stem cell, which is one cell line for everyone. Um, that would simplify um, preparing the product. It could be an off-the-shelf product. Ideally, there'd be no immune suppression required. It could take a long time to engineer such a line, depending on how you do it, but you've only got to do it once and then you're done. So it could be worth the investment. Uh, the cost would be low, the regulatory burden is low, and you'd only have to optimize your protocols for a single line. Next slide. So uh, 
I, one approach is to not worry about HLA in the way you engineer this line, but go after other immune uh, regulatory molecules when you try and make a universal donor cell line. And there are many, many molecules that regulate immunity that could be conceived of in building a universal donor cell. This is one interesting paper that came out a couple years ago where they, they took pluripotent stem cells, they did gene editing to knock in, um, in the HPRT gene a cassette that expresses CTLA, CTLA4IG, which is a secreted protein to block co-stimulatory responses, PDL1, programmed death ligand 1, which would also inhibit the T cells, and they generated pluripotent stem cells that express these molecules. They could then show that these cells were not rejected, but that took uh, actually a lot of work because there's not a good animal model to study human allogeneic rejection. And in fact, these uh, investigators use what they call a humice, where you take fetal liver and fetal thymus uh, from a human and put it in a mouse, and the idea is you're going to get a more human immune system that's not going to have a massive xenogeneic response against the mouse. Um, and using that system, they were able to show uh, that the wild-type cells uh, were rejected by the humice and had infiltration of T cells, whereas the cells expressing these two molecules, CTLA-4 and PDL one were not rejected. So, uh, and they could show that the wild-type cells accumulated human T cells, the engineered ones did not, and you could see the difference in the size of the teratoma. So here's a good example of how you might go after non-HLA genes to create a universal donor cell. And it's also a good example of how, how, how difficult it is to prove the cell you made is going to work because obviously making these mice is not trivial. A lot of labs will not be able to do that. The slide I showed you before about non-human primates is not going to be easy for people to pursue as well. And it's a real problem in the field when we try and develop these sorts of cells that resist allogeneic responses. How do we prove they're going to work in vivo? Next slide. Of course, most approaches deal directly with HLA. Um, and a lot of groups and papers have come out proposing different ways to modify the HLA or MHC genes to create universal donor cells. Uh, the HLA class 1 molecules, which are the ones present on all cells, are, all have a beta 2 microglobulin common subunit. And more than 25 years ago, uh, two very uh, important papers knocked out beta 2 in mice uh, and could show that these mice lived. They didn't have CD8, um, CD8 cells. Uh, because this is what CD8 cells recognize. Um, and importantly, several follow-up papers took organs from those mice that don't express class 1 and transplanted them into other mouse strains and so that the organs live longer, kidneys and hearts and pancreatic islets, sort of creating a first-generation universal donor line and showing that it was possible to make a line that would survive in an allogeneic host. Of course, uh, in the next slide, it, it was rapidly shown um, that this, wasn't, that this simple solution wasn't going to work. Next slide, please. Um, and that's because uh, if you have a totally class 1 negative cell, it's going to be killed by natural killer cells. And that was shown right away in the mouse model that class 1 negative blood cells are lysed by host NK cells. It's called the missing self hypothesis. Um, it's probably also an issue for solid organ cells, although it's been more difficult to prove that. Uh, it's caused by a lack of binding to inhibitory NK receptors, uh, which the class 1 molecules would normally bind to. And importantly, it can be prevented by non-classical class 1 molecules. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, this data here just shows data from our lab that when you knock out beta 2 microglobulin in a human pluripotent stem cell, you get the same result. So here's wild type cells in a chromium release assay, and they are not recognized by NKs. Um, anywhere near like the wild type or the K562 control cells, but when we knock out beta 2, they are in fact lysed again by NK cells. So this missing cell phenomenon is going to be, it's going to be in play for human cells as well. <coughs> Next slide. So as I mentioned, you can possibly inhibit this with a non-classical class 1 molecule. The one uh, that is probably the most important one to go after is HLA-E. It's also a heterodimer with beta-2 microglobulin. Um, it's not polymorphic, so there's two alleles which differ in one amino acid, and it's never been shown to stimulate any kind of immune response. So that's key. You could express this in a cell and not make it allogeneic. Um, they normally present peptide antigens that are the signal sequences of other HLA proteins, so it really is central to this whole 
missing cell phenomena. Uh, it's been shown that it, you can block the NK-mediated lysis of class one negative cell lines. We know exactly what receptor, the inhibitory receptor it binds to, and HLAG, which I won't talk about, probably could be used in, for similar purposes. Next slide. So because we, we want to express only HLAE, we need to express it in a beta-2 knockout background. So the way to do that is to make a fusion protein, so because obviously we need beta-2 for HLAE as well. Uh, we can have a, a dimer that has beta-2 fused to the HLE heavy chain, or a trimer that also has this specific peptide fused as well. Um, and we made both versions, HLAE dimers and trimers. So what we did was knock out one allele of beta-2, once again, with AAV-mediated gene editing. The second allele is a knock-in, where the HLAE dimer or E-trimer molecule is knocked into the beta-2 locus, expressed from the beta-2 promoter, so it's regulated properly. And that was our approach to make what we thought would be a, a first-generation universal donor cell. Uh, and you can see that it behaves as we would like. The wild-type cells express a little bit of E and a lot of ABC. Um, the negative cells that have both alleles knocked out don't express any of these molecules. Uh, when we put the E-dimer back in, we have a cell line that expresses the E-dimer. It's induced by interferon. It doesn't express a, B, or C, and the same is true with the trimer expressed at even higher levels, probably because the peptide is already permanently there. So you can make a cell line that only expresses a non-polymorphic HLA molecule and no polymorphic molecules. Next slide. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, we can show in vitro that the cells behave the way we like. Um, they are not lysed by NK cells. Once again, a standard chromium release assay. Wild type cells, this is your baseline level. You knock out beta 2 and make class 1 negative cells. It's lysed more frequently. And if you put back in the E dimer or E trimer, you, it's no longer lysed. In fact, it's lysed less than wild type, possibly because E is expressed at even above normal levels. And we can also show that it doesn't uh, stimulate CD8 cells. Of course, the wild type cells do because they're expressing all the HLA molecules that are allogeneic, and none of the knockouts do, including those with the E dimer and E trimer. So, in vitro, it's behaving the way we'd like. And we can also do some in vivo experiments. Next slide. Um, as I said, there's no really good in vivo model for human allogeneic responses. Uh, in this case, what we've done is take our pluripotent cells, put in a luciferase vector so we can track it differentiate them into hematopoietic cells, inject them into the peritoneum, and then image the mice, then come back later and inject NK92 cells, which is a natural killer cell line that we know will, will kill uh, the beta-2 negative cells in vitro, and we then image the mice. And you can see that pre-injection, all the mice have high levels of the transplanted cells, and after we put the NK92s in, uh, the beta-2 negative the cells are eliminated, uh, but those with the E trimer are not, and we can quantitate that as well. So at least in this model, once again, a somewhat artificial model, we can show that in vivo these cells are not going to be destroyed. Next slide. Of course, I, I have mentioned now twice that these, these mouse models are not great for human allogeneic responses. can also do some of it in a mouse-to-mouse -mouse system, which is shown here. In this case, what we've done is, is make iPSCs from different mouse strains, either wild-type BALB-C, wild-type BLAC6, or a MHC-negative BLAC6, and then put back in the QA1B molecule exactly the same way we put in HLAE. QA1B is the HLAE homologue in mice. So this, these are equivalent to the cell lines I showed you, the human cell lines I showed you in the last slide. We then put these into recipients to try and grow teratomas. And in this case, all the recipients were BALB-C mice. So BALB-C into BALB-C makes the biggest teratomas. Black 6 wild type into BALB-C, you barely get anything. It's mostly just scar tissue when you weigh it. Uh, the same is true with the knockout, but when you put QA1B back in, the teratomas start to survive again. So we think this is going to be a good model to actually study a true allogeneic response. Next slide. Uh, so, I, I, of course, class two is the other problem um, that we need to deal with. As I mentioned, uh, solid organ cells may also upregulate class two in, in transplant settings. But this is a much easier problem to engineer away um, because uh, there is no real negative side to, to not having class two, unlike class one. Uh, 
The problem is, though, these class II molecules, they have variable beta and alpha chains, so there's no simple one gene you could knock out to get rid of all of these. Instead, what the approach that multiple groups have taken is to go after the genes that cause bare lymphocyte syndrome, which is a clinical condition where the patients don't express class II. All these genes form one transcription factor complex that regulates class II, so all you have to do is knock out one of these genes and you prevent class II expression. And we did that by knocking out RFX A and K, and we could show that these cells still make hematopoietic cells uh, normally, but they're not class II positive. We don't see any HLA-DR expression in this case. So class II is, is relatively simple to eliminate from a universal donor line. Next slide. So um, I talked a lot about pluripotent stem cells, uh, which I do think is going to be increasingly prevalent in, in regenerative medicine as we get better and better at differentiating them into therapeutic products. And we'll be able to engineer these universal donor lines with multiple steps of gene editing and, and gene delivery because you only have to make it once. You can literally spend years building the line exactly the way you want. But, of course, there's a lot of stuff going on with other cell types, and I wanted to put this paper up here because uh, probably a lot of you have heard of it, and it's a really interesting study where they tried to make universal CAR T cells. And I put it in quotes because it's not universal in the way that I've been describing the pluripotent cells. Uh, this will survive in an allogeneic recipient, but only if that recipient has had their immune system wiped out. Uh, which is sort of cheating in the universal donor field, I think. But um, having said that, it allows you to treat a patient that otherwise would not be able to donate uh, T cells and have their own autologous therapy. And it's a really interesting paper um, that highlights the possibility. So I want to go over what they did. In this case, they took uh, in patients with acute lymphocytic leukemia. They first put in the CAR molecule, and I'm sure everyone knows what CARs are, with a lentiviral vector, and then they electroporated talons to knock out two genes, uh, CD52, which is a surface protein that, you, that would bind a monoclonal antibody, so you can, and that antibody is used to eliminate the endogenous T cells. So it allows these engineered T cells to survive while the endogenous T cells got eliminated. And they also knocked out the T cell receptor, uh, which prevents these cells from causing graft-versus-host disease and recognizing all the foreign antigens in the host. So very elegant design of the experiment. Here's one of the patients. If you look at the levels of minimal residual disease, you can see this patient was not in remission, they, and that was why they got the therapy. Uh, but once they got the CAR T cells, the disease disappeared. And it probably was not due to the extra conditioning because that never really worked before. Uh, but now you see it went away. Uh, showing really how impressive this therapy could work. And you could take these allogeneic cells and give them to multiple different infants. They gave them to two different individuals in the paper. And uh, ultimately, though, of course, uh, these are allogeneic cells, and the patient will recover their immune system. In this case, they got another allogeneic transplant, and we presume that at that point these cells rejected all of the CAR T cells that were infused, and it was a short-lived therapy but all be a very interesting universal uh, donor cell therapy approach. Uh, the, the only other point I want to make about this is it, was, it really highlights the difference between adult and pluripotent cells, um, which is that 5% of the cells had translocations uh, when they looked at the karyotypes uh, due to the talons uh, cutting and then ligating two different breaks and making a translocation. And, and it didn't cause a problem in these patients, um, and presumably it wouldn't because ultimately all these cells are going to get rejected when, this, when the patients get another allogeneic transplant. But that's the problem when you use adult cells that you can't clone, is you're going to have a mixed bag of cells after whatever editing or engineering step is done, they're not all going to be exactly what you want, and you may have many, many cells in that population that have, mutation, that have unwanted mutations. So, uh, in this case, it, it was fine, but you can imagine if you want the cells to survive forever, you really can't have 5% of them with abnormal karyotypes, and, it, and we don't even know what the true number is that could be tolerated. So uh, that's one reason to really focus on the pluripotent cell as a source, because you can clone the cell from a, and know exactly what that cell was and just try to keep track of what happened after it, it grew from there. Um, next slide. So to summarize, um, 
there are, of course, I mean, I think everyone could appreciate how great it would be to have one universal donor cell that could work for all therapies. Um, it would be an off-the-shelf product. You could make a giant lot of it in your company and treat thousands of patients with the same preparation. It all sounds great, but of course, there are serious concerns that this approach raises as well. There's a reason for allogeneic responses. Um, there's more than one reason, and one of them is cancer. So we, we know that that's part of the way we reject tumor cells. So is this going to be a problem if we have a universal donor cell? Is it going to be a universal tumor cell? Um, and I, I, there's a few things to think about when, when you bring that topic up. One is that we know from studies in mice and even HLA-negative people that have TAP1 mutations or these bare lymphocyte syndrome patients, they don't get more tumors. Uh, okay? The, the f incidence of tumor formation is not increased. What we're really worried about is getting rid of whatever tumors may spontaneously form because they're going to be evading the immune response. Um, I think a key part of any kind of universal donor therapy will be suicide genes. We're going to need a way to get rid of cells if, if the immune system can't. And in many cases, we also may want to titrate the dose of the transplanted cells using a suicide gene. So um, there are many different suicide genes out there. Probably these, these, at least the pluripotent stem cells that are engineered can have multiple different suicide genes in there depending on the clinical setting. And I think that's going to be very important to get the cells both approved and to really make them safe. A lot of applications are, involve terminally differentiated cells or even possibly irradiated cell products. These are not going to be such a concern because the cells are very unlikely to form a tumor. So, for example, cardiomyocytes, very rare that you'd get a tumor out of those cells. Uh, you can irradiate platelets. You can irradiate red cells. Same with RPE, unlikely to form a tumor. So some applications, it won't be such an issue. And finally, the advantage of having a, a, a product that's prepared ahead of time is you can do extensive safety testing, whole genome sequence analysis on a single clone, RNA-seq, et cetera, et cetera. And it may turn out that when we're able to do all that stuff and interpret the data, it's actually safer uh, than, than using an autologous product where all that stuff's out of our control. And of course, the other issue is infections. Um, you can imagine that with no presentation of, antigen, of peptide antigens, you're going to have infected cells that survive in the body, and that is certainly a theoretical possibility. But we do know that, at least in MHC-negative mice, there's other redundant mechanisms used to fight infections. Um, many applications and are going to involve transplanting hosts with normal immune systems, so they'll be fully, uh, have a fully normal immune system, unlike all these MHC-negative mice, so that will help. A lot of the transplantation may be in sequestered sites that, where they won't see a lot of viruses. And finally, once again, you have the suicide gene option, I think, if that turned out to be a problem. Of course, someone who's had their heart repaired with pluripotent stem cells and then gets an infection might not want to have all of their heart removed by a suicide gene activation. So it depends on the application, depends on the cell type, but these are the two big issues, I think, that come up when you design a product that avoids an allogeneic response. So that's the end of my talk. I'll stop there. I, the next slide just put up the part of the talk that was from my own lab. I'd like to thank Laura and Hermann and Eric who generated the data and the funding sources that supported it. Thank you. We have time uh, for we have time for just uh, a couple questions. Uh, Hi, thank you for a great talk. Um, so I just wanted to ask, we, we have an allogeneic immortalized clonal line that has a uh, suicide gene in it that we put into patients. We are eliminating, we're screening, they're HLA negative, but we screen patients out if they have the HLA1 antigen. So a certain percent of patients we're not treating because of that. But out of 20 patients, two still developed an immune response to the cells. Do you have, is there any way to, I, I, don't know how to fi, I don't know exactly how to figure out why and how to overcome a well, developed immune response to an HLA negative. How did you get an HLA negative HLA cell? HLA class 2 negative. Well, there's HLA class 1. But we're, we eliminated the patients who had the antibodies to that HLA class 1. But, couldn't but they, they developed it. They could develop them. And also, minor histocompatibility antigens are going to be an issue. 
If you remove major histocompatibility proteins, you don't present minors because they're presented by the major ones. Um, but if you have even matched major histocompatibility, you've got the minor antigens that could still be stimulating the immune response. I'd have to see more about exactly how your cell was engineered, okay. but, and I could Thank talk to you later if you like. Uh, so there's a lot of heterogeneity in NK cell populations, so not all NK cells are NKG2A positive. So I, I know if you use like a cell line clone, like it works because they're all, they will all would express NKG2A, but in regular NK cells, do you think there's some that would not, that would still be able to kill? Yes, excellent question. So about maybe 80% of normal human NK cells actually express the inhibitory receptor that binds HLA-E. So in, even in the best of all worlds, we're only going to be inhibiting 80% of the NK cells. Um, there's two possible reasons that might work just fine. One is it's sort of a mob psychology. If 80% of the NK cells say no, the other 20% may just go along with it. Uh, it's quite complicated. And we sort of saw that in vitro it, with the allogeneic NK cells we used in chromium release assays. Um, but also, you know, there's other inhibitory receptors we could go after. Uh, and this was still, there's always a next generation line. Uh, and you could put in uh, something that might bind an inhibitory KIR receptor or some other receptor on the NKs to try and get, solve the problem in that 20% of cells that don't uh, bind HLA-E. So very complicated story, but I think there are ways to engineer a solution. Okay. Uh, that wraps up the session. Thank you for uh, your attendance, and please rec uh, 